It starts out as uh, something that you've trained for all your life, trying to make a difference. The cool thing is, as an A-10 pilot, on times when the stars align and you're up on that mission, uh, where you get to make a difference, you get to see the reward. It's a pretty easy answer to in terms of why are we here. Number one priority is always saving guys on the ground. The people that we uh, so closely work with, the, the guy on the ground. That's my whole soul and being is that guy on the ground. Uh, you know, he could be an 18 year old guy, 18 year old kid with a rifle. That's all he's got and I'm here to protect him. Sanitized dog tags, ID card, and left breast pocket, ED kit, watch tape, smart pack, in-flight guides, maps, DTCs, RMMs. Uh, let's see, visor, pedal packs, water, snacks, seat cushion if you guys want to take that. Cell phones, you got one, you have yours, okay, signed up. One random Friday, uh, spring of 03, so right after the, uh, uh, the Iraqi invasion, uh, three guys in flight suits walked into the bar on campus and started talking about flying. And I was a year away from graduating, not really knowing what I wanted to do in life, and then this guy started talking about flying fighters and uh, being a fighter pilot and being in the Air Force and how awesome it was, and uh, it kind of uh, hit, hit a nerve with me, if you will. Attack! How I got interested in the A-10, uh, I can still remember it to this day. Uh, it, I was at a, uh, a hobby store because I, like a lot of kids, interested in aviation. I built a lot of airplane models. And this was 1979. I was in, in high school and went to the hobby store and they had a Ravel model of the, the for then, brand new A-10. Uh, it, it had only been operational for a couple of years at that point. And I just saw, and I remember, I can still remember to this day looking at the the wall of models and just trying to pick what I was going to build next and I saw this the box and the picture and I was like what in the world is that? During about the last month of pilot training is where you put in for what airplanes you want to fly. And I was torn on the F-15E or the A-10 on which one I wanted to put number one on my list you know so luckily uh, uh, one of the respected IPs in our flight had flown both the A-10 and the F-15E and all he said to me was Mitchell what patch do I wear on my shoulder on Fridays? And the patch you always had on was the A-10. So I ended up putting the A-10 as number one, uh, and I loved the mission, the thought of the mission at the time. And
I was a uh, first lieutenant. Uh, I was 26 years old uh, when, when Desert Storm kicked off. The 26-year-old fighter pilot caught the nation's attention a few months ago when he and a partner shot down a record number of Iraqi tanks. You just never forget when you look down and realize that somebody's trying to shoot you down and you've got to, to, uh, to kill him first. My first uh, full two years in the Air Force, it was pretty much a completely Cold War type of uh, mentality. Our training was all very low altitude. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't seem that long ago to me, but uh, I know talking to a lot of the guys now, you know, they're, it, it, it's uh, been quite a while ago. And, and when you look at the airplane from then to now, it's, it's pretty amazing the different upgrades and, uh, that we've gone through since then. The A-10 is the only airframe ever that was built entirely for this mission. Yo, come on, man. They're about to do a gun run. You need to get down. Let's go, buddy. Come on, man. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> There's just nothing that matches uh, the devastation that that gun can uh, can bring. Awesome testament to the to the aircraft. I think that the, the same gun that we used to kill main battle tanks in 1991 is the same gun where uh, we can shoot a single insurgent uh, that's fleeing on a on a motorcycle or uh, or uh, shooting our, at our guys from a uh, from a tree line. Point is, you know, the A-10 was built for ground combat. Okay, ground combat has we had the old linear battlefield type where we're going to go fight a bunch of tanks going low at 100 feet and then we've morphed into a medium altitude precision strike platform because the airplane has been updated and modified to be able to do that. Sensors are great, they're amazing, they, they enable precision strike, they enable us to generate coordinates that, that are pristine, that are right on the target, but that will never replace just you know looking right outside of my cockpit and looking at the battle space. What am I seeing out there big picture? We do have this personal connection with the people that we uh, so closely work with, the, the guy on the ground. Uh, we hear uh, him getting scared. Request immediate re attack, same remarks, same restrictions, from last hit, north 75 meters. We hear him getting excited. We Here we go, that's it. Good hit, good hit, good hit. Dash 2, I need you in the same, same remarks, same restrictions. We hear the bullets flying. We hear him taking cover. We hear him breathing hard, uh, and and it's, it's it becomes a very personal, uh, a very personal mission, uh, especially when when you start hearing about guys uh, taking casualties uh, down there. You take that that hits very very close to home. Nobody ever wants to hear that. We care about guys on the ground. We do our mission in relationship to guys on the ground. We are support element essentially for the army. We care about the guy on the ground. I'm not saying air addiction mission isn't caring about the guy on the ground, but it's not tangible. You can't really grab the benefits of it right then. You're going to wait a certain amount of time to see its effects. Air to air, how's that about the guy on the ground? Well, you're building air superiority, air supremacy, correct. But is the guy on the ground going to see it, get the tangible benefits of it? No. Close air support is about the guy on the ground. Combat search and rescue is about the guy on the ground. Um, we're joint. We're a joint airframe and an air force, and that's what makes us different.
Okay, uh, today we're going down to Sande Sufla. We've been there recently, so we've got a good lay of the land. Um, keep in mind, the spiny has been pretty hot recently and they've had some contact from the same area around Sande Sufla. Uh, he went over the recent activity. Keep in mind the uh, kind of MO we've had recently out of there. They've seen the, the Taliban commander kind of looking at the objective first, doing a quick meeting, picking up weapons en route. Usually there's motorcycles involved. Uh, you've also got the uh, Taliban commander that they uh, seeked a couple weeks ago. So you've got all that stuff going on right there in Aspandi. We're going right into the heat of that. So keep that in mind as, uh, as we get down there. Keep your eyes open and uh, stay vigilant. All right, so our actions on contact, near and far ambush, return fire. Look to me, we'll either maneuver or we'll push through. IED, get 360 degree security and clear the danger area. And then we'll look to Kazavak. Uh, in the case of a complex attack, we're going to return fire, move out of the kill zone. Indirect fire, get down, look for uh, distance and direction from me. Our actions on halt, take a knee, face out, and uh, the march intervals that we're going to use are going to be dependent on where we are uh, in the open area, spread out as much as you can. The bigger we can look and the more intimidated we can look, the uh, less likely we're going to take contact as we move down there. That's all I've got. What are your questions? All right, we're kidding up. It's 0615. 0615, kids on. Shit, just say anything about her. Yesterday, as most days, we went out on a dismounted patrol uh, south of our FOB to a village of Aspondi. Uh, basically, we got some intel that uh, some bad guys were storing weapons in a building, and we had contacted them before. We'd run into them before. So we went down there to kind of check back up. And uh, as we got down into the village, um, we ran into some, some sketchy guys. It just, everything felt weird from the time we got down there. There was high tension. You could tell by the, the NA's body language. He was antsy, pacing back and forth. The second that happened, we, we know we spread out, let the, the PL do his link up. Uh, it was just high tension. I felt from from the get go. Hey, let's go. Go, go push. He said everybody is the teachers here, so we are good people. Okay, if they're blah, 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 good people, they have nothing to worry about. Yeah. We're not going to take it. Uh, just a lot of a lot of uh, sketchy reports. No one had uh, the same same story. Everyone, they were all family. They all lived in the same compound, but no one's story matched up. Unfortunately, we weren't able to detain them. Um, so as we started to uh, to RTB to head back to the base, um, we got word that the Taliban were maneuvering on us from the south. Again, be advised right now, uh, we're uh, picking up and moving back uh, through Aspande uh, towards uh, Ghazni. Mutant enter, we go. And uh, Hog, if I could get you uh, overhead of our uh, lead element uh, through a spondy, if uh, at all possible. As we were headed back to the base, we had to cross about two kilometers of open desert. We were definitely in a, a huge open danger area. We got about 500 meters outside of the village 
and started taking uh, some pretty accurate fire. There was no cover. I mean, there were people trying to find tire tracks to hide, to get a little bit of a defilade behind. Uh, you know, in, in that position, the best you can do is spread out, gain fire superiority, you know, and then wait for, for some air support. Our comms were a bit of an issue at the time, and so they had a little bit of a struggle, uh, but they did have uh, A-10s luckily being pushed down to us. I have your position south of the tree line. We were quickly responded and uh, working with the JFO on the ground and, and uh, one of my JTACs were able to get Hog on, on station quite quickly. We were taking some harassing fire at that point. Right here. Hey man, they're busy, but I need full security, brother. Who's like, shooting? Bro. Somebody's fucking shooting at us still. Uh, but luckily we had uh, the A-10s on station to uh, come in and do a nice show of force, which is always a, uh, a clincher for the enemy because because they know what that entails. The A-10 has proven itself time and again as being um, really a nightmare to the enemy. Just its mere presence alone is enough to get uh, to keep the enemy at bay and, uh, and in that situation right there uh, again just bringing those guys in quick and fast um, uh, was enough to push uh, push the enemy uh, away from our forces the ground troops that i work with uh, when they think close air support they think a10s and i think the reason for that is uh, they almost share the same mentality um, if you were to say that there's a grunt in the sky it'd be a hog pilot They're very user friendly. I mean, any one of these dudes could pick up the radio if I get shot in the face and, uh, you know, employ. Those guys are really professional, very well trained. And if, uh, you know, you have a random Joe who doesn't know what to do, those, those guys can pull it from them. To win a war, you need boots on the ground. And to have boots on the ground, you need support. And you need the right kind of support to have boots on the ground. And it's the A-10, honestly. Even sometimes just the sound. Or just telling the ground commander, hey, A-10's on its way, or we have aircraft supporting that we hear in five mics. And he asks what it is, you say, hey, we got an A-10 coming on. It's, 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 uh, yeah, it picks them up a little bit. That sound is so distinguishable. It literally shakes the ground. It is amazing. Uh, you hear it first when it fires, and then you hear it echo from the gun in the sky. It, it, that sound right there just drives 11 Bravo is nuts. It's amazing. Hey, thanks, sir. I just shit my pants. <laughs> it's that sound of uh, uh, <laughs> corny like freedom, but it, it really is. It's just, it's the sound of don't mess with me. It, it, scares off everyone and shows you you're in good hands. I think when people 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road look back on it, I think people will look at this airframe and it will always be known as an airframe that was, some people view it as ugly, who'd want to fly that thing? 
But you know what? It was an airframe that got the job done. It got bombs on target when it mattered most, and guys went home to their wives and kids because of the airframe. It, it makes it, uh, it's very humbling It's that uh, we are so trusted and, and liked by the ground forces. I think that's something that uh, I'm very, very proud of. They love this airplane, uh, and, and uh, they trust us is the biggest thing. I mean, when you're shooting last night, uh, we just looked at it, it was uh, between 65 and 100 meters away from the, from the friendly guys. And for those guys to, to trust us uh, to do that uh, on a regular basis uh, is, uh, is very gratifying. I got the greatest job in the world, man. I get to fly fighters when, uh, when people need me to do my job. I have the chance to save lives uh, and, and make a difference on the battlefield. Um, that is the mo when you when you hear the, the machine guns going off in the background when JTAC's screaming the bullets are hitting in his feet and you can hear the bullets pinging off the Humvee that he's hiding behind uh, and then all of a sudden you roll in uh, you know put some rounds down and take care of his problem for him uh, and then you know you can hear the relief in his voice that is the most rewarding and fulfilling thing that I can think of. You've got a huge group of experts at what they do with a singular focus and. You can't really get that back once it's broken out.